Hi, this is Teresa Martin from Lower Cape TV, and welcome to this episode of Legislative Update. With me today is State Senator Julian Sear, and welcome, and Good it's great to, to have you, you here. Teresa. So it's been a little bit since we've talked, and lots of exciting things have happened, um, starting with education. Can you tell us a little bit about what just passed in the Senate? Sure. So, um, you know, broadly, right, education, I think, is one of the, I really believe, it is one of the, the best investments, really the best investment we make in our future. Um, and, and, and Massachusetts has led the way on this, you know, gosh, since we've even had public schools, mm -hmm. right? We had the first public, first public schools in the nation were here in Massachusetts. Uh, it's actually written into our, our state constitution that we need to provide an equitable education to all mm -hmm. students. Uh, and so what, what what's emerged, particularly in the decades since the last big education reform um, package was was signed into law in 1993. Uh, was really there's a, a, as a disconnect in how the state how the state really estimates the need of a given school district, um, and how the state is looking at targeting resources for the, some of the most neediest students in the wow. Commonwealth. So this has been an issue on the Cape for a while. The way that our housing values affect what our schools qualify for, there's there's a disconnect. So the original formula was just based on property tax values. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a law, an update in the law passed uh, in, in 2010 uh, that took mm -hmm. also into account income, which mm -hmm. I think helps us here. Um, but also our, our schools are changing as well here. Um, we have more and more uh, students who are English language learners. Uh, that's a pretty significant, you know, when, when you have a student who is in a classroom and, and, and who doesn't have good English language skills, they're, they're, they have a whole host of needs, right, that the school district right, needs right. to provide. Um, we also actually are seeing more low-income students. Uh, so here in Nauset, uh, in the Nauset district, mm -hmm. now 25% of the students in the Nauset district qualify for free or reduced lunch. That's that's pretty significant. So what we aim to do, and, and, and what we just did in this bill mm -hmm. that was passed in the Senate, it's called the Student Opportunity Act. And it's the, the, the biggest change to the Chapter 70 funding formula. This is the formula that uh, determines K through 12 state support for could, public schools. People in education use that as short. Yeah, Chapter yeah. 70, right? So Chap Chapter 70, it, it's it's the section in, in, in the general laws and Chapter 70 is this formula. Um, and so we make a substantial amount of updates to this. Mm -hmm. uh, First, we change how we're counting low-income students. Uh, under the old formula, mm -hmm. um, only students who are only up to 130% of the federal poverty level were counted. Now we're counting to up to 180%. So we're going to capture more children who are low-income. We know that it mm -hmm. takes more resources uh, to educate or, 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 or to get low-income uh, students from low-income backgrounds. Mm -hmm. um, on par with their peers. We direct much more resources to schools for low-income students, right. uh, or not just low-income students, excuse me. Um, we direct much more resources to schools for English language learner students as well. So- Well, let me ask you a question yep. though before you go on. So if this formula has changed and it affects us here, won't it affect every place and won't every school district exactly. be wanting? So it's a, it's a, it's a $1.4 billion investment in education, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is pretty sizable. That's uh, <laughs> not every day do, do you do a $1.4 billion investment. Right. Um, it's actually $1.5 billion if you include some other uh, one-time supports. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, we've been implementing this in the FY20 budget. We increased Chapter 70 funding by $300 million. Mm -hmm. We essentially are going to need to do that every year for the next seven years. It'll it'll be a one point four billion dollar investment over se seven years. That's above and beyond inflation. So under the mm -hmm. formula with inflation, you add that one point four billion. It's really uh, two point one billion extra into the K through twelve project public education system. On English language learners, mm -hmm. we put more resources and we we sort of flip the resources of where they're going. So under the current system, you actually get more money. School district gets more money for. Um, a student in first or second or third grade mm -hmm. for little kids uh, and less money for an English language learner, uh, say, in high school. Right. It, it, really, the needs are, you know, reversed. If you have a kindergartner, um, they're going to pick up language a lot quicker mm -hmm. than, say, a, a freshman or sophomore. Mm -hmm. uh, this bill also does really big things, particularly around transportation and special right. education costs. So the state has a, the circuit, a special education circuit breaker. Right, say, say what that is because, sure. again, this is people in education use circuit breaker a yep. lot. So th the circuit breaker just essentially means it's it's a reimbursement mm -hmm. from the state. So, so a school district outlays a certain amount of money and the state will reimburse for up to 75% of the special education costs, uh, particularly out of district costs. These are very sizable costs for districts. Um, 
Under the old formula, mm -hmm. this only included instruction. So we didn't include transportation costs. Under the new formula, or the updated formula rather, um, we're going to include transportation in the sped circuit breaker. This is big things, particularly for the Nauset district right. and the Monomore districts, where you are sending a number of special needs students um, across the Cape, through the Cape Cod Collaborative and elsewhere. Uh, so that's in there. Mm -hmm. uh, another piece that's really important for us here, you know, particularly in communities where we see declining enrollment, mm -hmm. um, that's very much the case in the Nauset district. Uh, it hasn't been as apparent because we've seen so much school choice into the right. Nauset district. But, you know, the, the the class size, I think of my class from 2004, mm -hmm. right? And I'm, I'm a product of the school right. district. Uh, you know, we were about 240, maybe mm -hmm. 40, 50 students. Mm -hmm. um, if you were just wrong on the four member towns of the district, that those classes would be a lot smaller. So right. we're dealing with some big challenges around enrollment mm -hmm. uh, and rural schools. We established a commission uh, in this bill to move swiftly around recommendations for uh, the needs of rural students and school districts with declining enrollment. How do we, how to really support them? That's going to benefit us here, certainly in the Nauset right. region, um, as well as Monomoy, certainly Nantucket, Martha's I mean, Vineyard as well. Pretty the whole Cape is, is really struggling. Uh, yes, but though, though uh, a little different in the Mid-Cape, I, right. I think in the Genesee Armouth District or Barnstable, Mashpee, um, they're not seeing the declines in enrollment that we see, particularly here on the Outer Cape, right. um, sort of the most acute. Actually, on Nantucket, they're actually seeing increasing enrollment. So they've had to actually build really? a new middle school. Yeah, the Nantucket Public Schools have, have um, expanded oh. dramatically, largely driven actually by the children of immigrant families, of immigrant workers who right. are staying on the island. Um, in the last decade, they've had uh, a 650% increase in wow. English language learners. H half the schools in the lower grades are, are students of color. Uh, it, it's pretty remarkable, but you see that here too. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I go to Provincetown or, or, or Truro, you know, elementary schools, um, and and those schools are, are are much more diverse, certainly right. than the classrooms that I grew up in, which I think is a really right. good thing. It is. Yeah. Because when you picture Nantucket, you don't picture that at all. You have the, the you know. Well, so much of my job, right, is is you picture Nantucket or you picture Truro, right? right. And folks have a. Um, my colleagues know the places because they're, you know, we're a little infamous and they're yeah, beautiful yeah, places yes. that folks vacation. Yeah. Uh, but I really work hard to kind of, you know, get folks to look under the hood mm -hmm. and, and to see what's really going on in our communities. Um, and it often is a little different than perceptions. Yes. yes. Yep. So this education bill, the Student Opportunity Act, it's a huge deal. Uh, the Senate passed this unanimously. Unanimously? So unanimously. Wait a second. That never happens. Yes. Uh, well, in the Senate, <laughs> it happens quite a bit. But, but um, uh, it, it's rare to have a $1.4 billion dollar investment that is passed unanimously. Wow. Uh, it now moves on to the House. The House is likely to take it up pretty swiftly. Mm -hmm. I think we'll, we'll um, you know, there's not too much that we changed mm -hmm. in the original bill. I was really fortunate. I sit on the Education Committee. Right. I'm the only member of the Cape and Islands delegation with a seat on that committee. Mm -hmm. uh, and so got to have a hand in shaping the initial bill that came out of the committee, went over to the Senate. Mm -hmm. We made some tweaks to it. Uh, but broadly, the sort of that bill is intact. Right. It's going to go to the House. They'll, they'll do the same. We'll reconcile this. But I think the goal is to get something done well in advance of the start of the 2020-2021 uh, 20, 20, 20, school year ask, so folks can budget yeah. for that and expect for it yeah. and plan for it. I mean, people are starting to work in their budgets right now yeah. for that year. But... Yeah. And so, you know, this this is a, it, it's a big deal. I mean, I think for even me personally, uh, it, it comes full circle. The first thing I ever did politically was when I was a, a you know junior at Nauset High mm -hmm. School, advocating for Proposition Two and a Half override <laughs> so we could save the, the music program here. Um, and so, you know, education is just a really critical investment, uh, and this is going to mean a lot of good, particularly for some of the most needy and vulnerable and left out kids and their families in the Commonwealth. Um, so, you know, a, a, a lot to happen implementation yeah. wise, but I think from a resource perspective. Mm -hmm. We have very much heard the fact that our school districts and our teachers uh, need more resources right. to give, you know, to give all students in Massachusetts the really first rate 21st century education they deserve yeah. and they're entitled to under the Constitution. Well, I think we sometimes forget in Massachusetts that we do complain about our schools because, you know, everybody does. Right. That's like a thing you do. But our schools, even our weakest schools here are pretty amazing compared to many other places in the country because we as a commonwealth have made a commitment to invest in education. Yes, I, I would say though the achievement gap in Massachusetts continues to be very persistent. So mm -hmm. whereas when you look at the state as a whole, you know, we're scoring top in the nation, 
you can put Massachusetts up against against you know up against any sort of high performing uh, you know um, industrialized country. Yeah. But when you look at the achievement gap, and you look at it particularly from a low income perspective, mm-hmm. and especially you look at comparing um, brown and black students with mm-hmm. with white and Asian students, mm-hmm. um, there's a pretty big gulf there. And so what this package is really meant to do is really infuse resources, particularly into our gateway cities, Mm -hmm. uh, into communities that have really been left out. Um, And then also, but also make sure that that everyone's getting more resources and those resources are targeted um, towards the neediest students. Uh, And you mentioned transportation with special needs. I know in all of our schools in the Outer Cape, transportation is a huge, huge thing. Is it being addressed in any other way? Yes, so we also address, um, there's a a further commitment in here to provide more resources around um, regional school transportation. Mm -hmm. I'm actually working with my colleague, Ann Gobi, uh, who represents uh, Central Massachusetts, Mm -hmm. she's from Spencer, and Senator Adam Hines from the western part of the Mm -hmm. state to see if we can get some more resources for reimbursement for regional school transportation costs in a supplemental budget that we're gonna pass Mm -hmm. soon. Uh, So we're always trying to get more resources there. Um, the challenge with the the regional school transportation, there actually was a commitment that dates back, I think it's dates back to the 1940s, that if school districts regionalized, mm-hmm. the state would pick up the tab um, on all of the uh, all of the transportation costs. Really? Um, that's only happened once uh, <laughs> since the 40s. Uh, so we're always fighting, you know, to, to get it up pretty high. I think I think in this year's budget, it's about an 80 percent reimbursement, which is mm-hmm. good. I'd like to see it, of course, get to 100 percent. Right. But but we're keeping on that as well. That's excellent. Because like I said, that is certainly one of our, our big challenges that you when you care about education, you need to get people from A to B, but it's sad to see money just going into transportation rather than indirect service. Well, and, and, it, and it's a big cost. And, and, and when, when school districts have to, you know, have to cut those costs, particularly it's, it's the early bus and the late bus, yeah. um, you know, that supports students, you know, particularly if you're living in a place like Toro, right? right, right. Um, and I remember this, I relied on those services, yeah. uh, you know, not too, too <laughs> long ago, um, you know, but, but the late bus, the early bus, those are really critical for students having a you know, a real rich life yeah. um, in the school, uh, part of a really, uh, you know, broad education. So that's, that's important too. Well, believe it or not, we are almost out of time, but I'm glad we, because this education bill is really important, so I'm glad we got a chance to dig into it. Just in a couple of, last couple of minutes, can you tell me what else is on the horizon and what else are you working on? So we're working on, uh, the Senate is looking to pass pretty significant climate change legislation. Uh, the House actually took up a bill uh, in uh, the summer before the August mm-hmm. recess. Uh, we'd like to do something. We're looking at it you know, in two lenses. One, we gotta look at adaptation, right? What do we have to change um, because of what we're seeing in a changing climate? Right. And then from a mitigation lens, right? How do we, how do we change what we're doing? Um, and so you, I think, I, I, not, not exactly sure what that's gonna look like. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got a, a proposal from the table on, from the House where um, they essentially, it's a, a billion dollar program over 10 years, mm-hmm. so a hundred million dollars a year. Uh, it's focused primarily on resources to municipalities, mm-hmm. uh, which is something I like. Okay. They pay for it uh, through bonding, so they're basically borrowing the money. Mm-hmm. I'd like to see a revenue stream for that. The governor p- put a proposal on the table as well mm-hmm. uh, to actually double the D's excise tax mm. uh, and use those dollars to, again, put towards you know climate resiliency and response. How about electric um, again, buses for our school districts? Yeah, exactly. A hundred million. <laughs> that's a hundred million over ten years. Um, frankly, I think we've got such a big challenge. I think we need to do two billion yeah. uh, over ten years, um, and I think it's really important that we have a revenue stream for this, right? So we shouldn't just be borrowing against our future, but really looking at all right, how do we generate some revenue here? Where is that going to come from? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of conversation how that dovetails with transportation. I think you'll see a robust conversation really about tolling and how do we use tolling or carbon pricing in other ways to finance some of the big needs we have around climate resiliency, I think also big needs around transportation and infrastructure. And then in, in my focus, we continue to look at mental health. Right. Um, and I expect you'll see some action on that in the coming months. So we're gonna have some good stuff to talk about next month. We always do. <laughs> well, once again, thank you very much for being with us. This is Teresa Martin from Lower Cape TV. With me is State Senator Julian Sear, and this has been this month's episode of Legislative Update.